Welcome to episode 19 of my guide to video game history. Back through the 80s, since IBM released its own PC and Compaq had released its own compatibles, the PC had been a hugely successful as a business machine, but as a games machine, not so much. With it not having the graphical capabilities or any sound beyond the internal speaker beeping, meaning that gaming was nigh on impossible. Things would slowly start to change, however, in 1984, when IBM asked Sierra Online's Roberta Williams to create a game for their new PC that was more geared towards the home user and so more geared towards games. Called the PC Junior, it was commercially a flop the game Roberta created was not. Called King's Quest, the game was revolutionary with the avatar character following the actions typed in by the gamer. It was also this game that encouraged Roland to make the first IBM PC sound card for the machine, and so giving PC games the possibility of in-game music and sound. Needless to say, a stack of Sierra titles were done, such as the Space Quest games, Please Quest, and the Leisure Suit Larry games. But it was safe to say that through the 80s, PC gamers had a tough time of it, with only a stack of adventure games and flight simulators to sate to their appetite. Oh sure, there was the odd classic such as Castle Wolfenstein by Muse Software in 1984 that would be released. A game, incidentally, that was so enjoyed by a certain John Romero from id Software that it would inspire him years later to do his own version of the game. But in the main, there was little to get the gamer's juices a-pumping. One game that was released in 1987 by Scott Miller in Florida was called Kingdom of Cross, a dungeon adventure that had you collecting gems and whipping monsters as you made your way through to the exit. Interestingly, the name Cross was just Zork backwards, which, along with the dungeon adventure Rogue, had so inspired him. One thing that Scott did with his game, however, was release the title as shareware. In other words, giving the first bit of the game for free, in the hope that gamers would love the game so much that they would pay for further episodes. This method of getting your game out there really worked well, and so Kingdom of Cross would be successful enough that by 1991, Scott was ready to set up his own publishing company called Apogee Software, and better known today as 3D Realms. It was set up by Scott Miller and George Broussard, who had run another PC publishing firm called Micro FX. They would continue to release games and encourage many other PC developers to join them, as their shareware distribution setup was working exceptionally well, with it being very cheap, with basically just uploading the game to the bulletin board PC and then allowing users on the internet to download the first bit of the game for free. Once that happened, those users would pass the game around via floppy disks to other friends who didn't have the internet, and so quickly these games would be available to, to a multitude of people, and so encourage many orders for the rest of the game. But it would be in 1990 when a new development software house joined Apogee that Apogee would start making a real name for itself. Called id Software, it would be set up when two computer programmers, John Romero and John Carmack, would be working at a company called Softdisk, a digital magazine where they would write games for a monthly publication. One of the best games in this period was Dangerous Dave, written by John Romero in 1988, which had your hapless hero jump his way through the levels collecting diamonds. Over this time, the two programmes had become good friends, impressed with each other's abilities. But it would be in September 1990 when John Carmack had written a routine that would do efficient full-screen scrolling, a feat thought impossible on PCs at the time. He and fellow programmer Tom Hall had used this in the graphics of John Romero and Dangerous Dave to create the whole first level of Super Mario Bros. 3. They knew they had something here, and that if they could release their own game away from Softdisk, they could make some good money, as there was nothing like it out there. Originally, they hoped to do a true Mario license for the 
PC. But when Nintendo showed no interest, they decided to follow another avenue that had opened up to them. Scott Miller of Apogee Software had been very impressed with the game Dangerous Dave, and had heard rumours of the talented programmers at Softdisk and the cool stuff that they were doing. So he attempted to contact them surreptitiously under the guise of being fan letters to John Romero for the game Dangerous Dave. But really, within these fan letters, he would instead write to John Romero, telling him of his publishing company, and that if they joined him, they would get better returns. So, the cream of soft disc, John Carmack, John Romero, Tom Hall, and Adrian Carmack, no relation to John Carmack, would leave and set up a, a new development house called id Software. The name comes from the Freudian term of id, or the inner self. In some sources, it also stood for in-demand software, which was another name that the troop quite liked. So armed with this clever scrolling routine by John Carmack, they set to work on their first game, which was released a couple of months later, December 1990. And it was called Commander Keen, an invasion of the Vorticons. They would release the game as episodes for Apogee Software, and it had you play an eight-year-old boy genius called Billy Blaze, who builds a rocket to go to Mars. The game was amazing for the time on the PC, and it's still extremely playable and fun even today, as Billy made his way across Mars. Further games would quickly follow, with id Software releasing to both Apogee and Softdisk, with such classics as Rescue Rover, a great puzzle game, and Shadow Knights, where you played a ninja. Id Software was beginning to make itself known as a key developer in the world of PCs, particularly known at this time for platform games. Other great games released in this period was Chris Roberts' space opera Wing Commander. In the game, you play a new pilot recruit who joins the spaceship, the Tiger Claw, and fight the war against the Kilrathi aliens. The game was a brilliant space shooter, made even better by the compelling story that drew you along and got you to care about the fellow pilots who you were fighting along inside. Expansion packs and a sequel would quickly follow in 1991, taking that story even further. But it would be in 1991 with the release of Hover Tank 3D in April that year that really began the path that id Software would become so synonymous with. Since writing the game engine for Commander Keen, John Carmack had been experimenting with 3D gaming. Sure, many others had done it first, from the RPG Akalabeth in 1979 on the Apple II, 3D Monster Maze in 1982 on the ZX80, and games like Cholo and Micronauts, and the brilliant freescape games such as Driller and Darkseid. And let's not forget Dungeon Master that would be released in 1987 and be most gamers' first experience of such detailed 3D visuals. Now, you could go on with the classics first-person shooters that came out before Hover Tank. Hover Tank may have not been the first, but for the PC it certainly was the quickest and smoothest, with John Carmack's super-fast game engine running it, and Adrian Carmack's fun visuals and drawn beasts. It was basically enjoyable, simple fun. Even better was it Software's next game, called Catacombs 3D. It was based on two old Catacomb games that John Carmack had written back when working for Softdisk. But for this third game, they would take the game engine used in Hover Tank, but set it in a fantasy-themed world of the Catacomb game. In the game, you play the High Wizard of Thoria, who must go on a quest to take on the evil Grel Minar. The game was good, but another long-standing game series called Ultima would be released called Ultima Underworld. The Stygian Abyss, released in 1992 by developer Blue Sky Productions. Interestingly, it would be Blue Sky Productions who would change their name to Looking Glass Studios and would bring such classic games as System Shock, Flight Unlimited and the Thief games. And their programming star, Doug Church, who had created all these titles, also went on to Iron Storm to do Deuce X. But his first 3D game 
would take all the greatness of the RPG Dungeon Master for having moving in real time. The game was impressive, inspired John Carmack and id Software to create their own version of the game engine to allow the wonderful looking visuals whilst keeping the game speed. This John achieved with the game engine being much faster on lower specification PCs, even if it didn't have all the graphical wizardry and nice looks of the ultimate game. For the game, they used an old PC game called Castle Wolfenstein and Beyond Castle Wolfenstein by Muse Software, that John Romero in particular had, had enjoyed as a kid. They took this concept of Nazi soldiers and built upon it, building a story by having an American-Polish prisoner of war, William Joseph Laskowitz, who must escape from Castle Wolfenstein. The game was brilliant, with flexible game engine allowing others to quickly knock together many levels for the game. And the game would be released under the Apogee publishing label, and would be an enormous success, with fun and simple run and gun quick gaming being something new and fresh for the PC market. Also, by being efficient and working on most PCs, it would quickly gather quite a following. Id Software, suddenly taken with such a hit, would quickly release Castle Wolfenstein's sequel called Spear of Destiny. This was actually a prequel to the first game and had you play Joseph Blazkowicz as a spy who was on a mission to recover the Spear of Destiny, a lance said to be used in the crucifixion of Jesus. This sequel would be published by Ford Gem Corporation and would be basically be more of the same run and gun fun action that gamers would love. Other great games released was Alone in the Dark by Infogram, which had you play Edward Carnby, a private eye sent to a haunted house to find a piano. But it would be in February 1993 when every Star Wars fanboy's dream would be realised with a flight simulator that allowed you to actually fly an X-Wing. Called Star Wars X-Wing, it was an amazing game allowing you to finally realise that dream of flying and taking out TIE Fighters, whilst adding much more depth and backstory to the original Star Wars universe. Of all the Wolfenstein clones released in the wake of its classic, the best was Blake Stone's Alien of Gold, released in December 1993. For those who've missed out on this classic game, buy it now, good old games, it is brilliant. You play a British spy hero on a mission to stop the evil Dr. Pyrus Goldfire from enslaving humanity. Written by Jam Productions, who had been set up by three other computer programmers who had also worked at Softdisk, where id Software had started out. It may have used the Wolfenstein engine, but as a playing experience, it was so much more fun, with so much more imagination to the game. Unfortunately, it would make little waves, as only a week later after its release, id Software would release their new game. For on the 10th of December 1993, id Software would release Doom, and it would eclipse all that went before it. It would also be the first game that id Software would publish themselves, and with the new game engine written by John Carmack, allowing stairs and full textures and change of lighting, meant that the game simply would wow gamers from the offset. According to John Carmack, this is why he chose the game name Doom because I always loved that scene in Colour of Money, where Tom Cruise walks up to the pool table and he's asked what he has in that long box. He says he has Doom. To say that the anticipation of the game is great would be an understatement, with early alphas leaked out onto the net and screenshots circling the internet and even causing the bulletin page to keep falling over as so many gamers were waiting for that game to be released. And so, the bulletin board would crash every time id Software tried to upload the shareware free level. Suddenly, id Software was top of the world, and the game would spread like wildfire on company networks and PC owners' machines, as they all wanted to play this new game. The game also went on, of course, to be converted to almost every type of console that could cope with the game engine at the time but it was Doom on the PC where it was first and best. There were two main factors which caused the world such Doom addiction. 
first and simply the game was really, really good and being absolutely gorgeous to look at. But it was the second factor that linked up PCs could be played at the same time, and so players could run round in the game and shoot each other. Called a deathmatch, a term coined by John Romero, it gave such unprecedented fun of virtually shooting fellow gamers as you raced around trying to kill each other. Such was the addictive quality of these games that many company networks would ground to a halt, as gamers tried to upload the game on their company. PCs. Many computer companies even did Doom Fridays, and so allowed the staff to just play the game of Doom on Friday afternoon, officially rather than sneakily behind the boss's back. For myself, I remember playing Doom on our own home network me and my friends had set up in our second year of university. The game was immensely addictive, as you had four PCs hooked up, and Doom was the game we loved. From satisfying gore and speed of the game, to the mighty weapons such as a BFG, otherwise known as a big effing gun, the game just kept on giving. A third thing that Doom brought to the table was game modding. Id Software had been very open with its game engine, allowing gamers to write their own levels for Doom. This kept the longevity of the game going, with lots of new levels coming up from all quarters. It would be in July 1994 that another developer, Epic Games, better known today for their Unreal games and Gears of War, would bring the big platformer Jazz Jackrabbit. This took inspirations of such classic games as Sonic and the cartoons of Bucky O'Hare, and created a fast-paced run-and-gun platform action game that was surprisingly fun and quick to play. Id Software would come back again in October the 10th, 1994, with Doom 2. This used the same game engine as Doom, but with some even more ingenious level designs, with the new Id member, American McGee, joining their ranks. One of the best companies to use the id game engine was the newly created developer Raven Software, better known today as the company that produced X-Men Legends and the Marvel Ultimate Alliance games. It had been set up back in 1991 by brothers Brian and Stephen Raphael back in 1990, and they'd already released such Dungeon Master inspired classics such as Black Crypt in 1992 and Shadow Caster in 1993, but it would be when they licensed the Doom engine and created Heretic in 1994 that would shoot them to fame. In the game you played a staff-wielding wizard in a sword and sorcery fantasy setting, but what made it particularly great was the imaginative level design that the Raphael brothers had put together. Bethesda Softworks, best known today for their Fallout 3 and Oblivion games, would be set up back in 1986 by Christopher Weaver, and had previously released the often overlooked Terminator games on the PC, and they would release a fantasy game called Elder Scrolls Arena in 1994. This used their own 3D game engine, but it gave you an open-ended world for which you could explore, and so giving gamers a much needed alternative to all that action, with a real-time RPG combined with an entire world for you to explore and discover, and so start the beginning of a brilliant new fantasy series. Looking Glass Studios and Doug Church would release System Shock in September 1994. This was a stunningly atmospheric game set in a futuristic cyberpunk world that would keep gamers on the edge of their seats or behind it, as it really was genuinely scary in places. Co-founder of id Software, Tom Hall, who had been forced to quit early on in the development of Doom, and so he went to Apogee Software, who also felt disgruntled at id Software for them backing out of letting them publish Doom. The game Tom Hall would release was called Rise of the Triads, released on December the 21st, 1994. This game was based amazingly on a heavily modified Wolfenstein 3D engine, and it really was one of the best Doom clones around, offering the gamer a much needed dose of tongue-in-cheek humour in the overly serious Doom games. Another developer starting out in 1994 
1984 was Bungie, better known today of course for their Halo games. They released the first person shooter Marathon on December the 21st, 1984. It was a brilliant game, but was missed by many as it was only on the Apple Mac. Still, for the game-starved Mac owners of the time, the game would be massively loved. LucasArts would follow on with their success of X-Wing, and so this time they would allow you to join the dark side and help overthrow the Rebel Alliance in TIE Fighter. This was not only a greatly improved flight engine, but with much more engaging story arc, and personally this was one of my favourite PC games back in the day. Blizzard Entertainment, or Silicon and Synapse, as they used to be called, had created many classic games since the three UCLA graduates, Michael Morahane, Alan Adham and Frank Pierce, had set up shop back in 1991. They would go on to create quality titles such as Lost Vikings, Black Thorn and Rock and Roll Racing. But it was in November 1994 when they released their next game called Warcraft Orcs vs Humans that yes, they I really know. would yes, hit a worldwide renown. Taking yeah. the real time strategy setup of Westwood's Dune 2 game, yeah, but with a fantasy setting and a touch of good humour, gamers would love. LucasArts, having already fulfilled so many fanboy fantasies with the X-Wing and TIE Fighter games, would release its own Doom clone this year in February 1995 with the game Dark Forces. In the game you play mercenary, Han Solo-esque character called Kyle Katab, who is sent on a variety of missions to help the Rebel Alliance. Actually, to say this is a Doom clone is a bit of a disservice really, as the game was so much more, with its own powerful game engine running things that allowed so much more possibilities to be done during the game, such as animated textures, shadowing, and also 3D cloud movements. And as for the game itself, it was much more of a running adventure with much more story and variety than its Doom game. But another favourite game for me at the time was the game Descent, released on the 17th of March 1995, and released by newly created development house Parallax Software, better known today as Volition Incorporated, who did the Red Faction and St. Row games. Set up by Mike Kulas and Matt Toslog, who met when working on the first Microsoft Flight Simulator game way back in 1986. It would also be them that had worked at Looking Glass Technologies as part of a team behind the groundbreaking Ultima Underworld game. But after Looking Glass failed to show an interest in their new game suggestion called Inferno, they decided to go it alone and create the game themselves, calling it eventually Descent, and it was to be published by Apogee Software. After the constraints of Doom was claimed, Descent was truly a revelation with its true 3D gameplay as you flew your way along the tunnels destroying the computer virus and robots. In 1995, Westwood Studios, who created the real-time strategy genre, would be back again to reclaim the crown of Blizzard Entertainment with their new game called Command and Conquer. It was a game that took all that had made their previous Doom 2 game so great, but set in a real-looking world albeit a parallel world where you have to take on the mighty evil army, the Brotherhood of Nod. As good as the single game was though, it was a multiplayer that really won over many gamers' hearts, with up to four armies being able to compete at once, and with gamers able to play not only across a local network, but even across the internet, which meant gamers would lose hours of their life to, to the dastardly addictive game. Raven Software would also create the sequel to their brilliant heretic game called Hexen and released on October the 30th, 1995. This personally is one of my favourite games, with its compelling complex level designs that allowed you to play three different warrior types through well thought out puzzles. 
Apogee software, now called 3D Realms, who have been so integral to the world of PC gaming, would decide to take their own Duke Nukem character to the world of 3D on the 29th of January 1996. The Duke games have been done by George Blussard, Alan H. Blum III and Todd Rep Logal and have been a fan favourite platformer by Apogee since 1991 when the first game was released, with gamers loving the sense of humour and rudeness of the game. They would do a sequel in 1993, even enlisting the writing talents of the ex-id co-founder Tom Hall. But it would be their third game when Duke went 3D, which won the gamers' hearts. Called Duke Nukem 3D, it again had you play a wise-cracking all-American hero as he sets off to single-handedly save the world from an alien invasion. This still, to this day, is my favourite first-person shooter. I just love the real world settings and the unashamed titillation and smut thrown in just to shock the world press. It was also a superior multiplayer experience in my opinion, with such devices as laser trip bombs and shrink rays making a much more fun multiplayer experience. Shrinking a fellow gamer and then stepping on them with your boot still goes down as one of the best deathmatch kills. The no programming map editor they also gave for the game also meant that it was possible even for non-programmers to design their own 3D maps and so create the ultimate deathmatch zones. 1996 may have brought such great titles as Descent 2 and Terminator Skynet, but it would be the release of id's next software title that gamers were desperately waiting for. Finally released in June the 22nd of 1996, the game was called Quake and had the totally 3D game environment for gamers to enjoy and levels designed that made full use of that extra dimension. Finally, the music was done by the brilliant Nine Inch Nails artist Trent Reznor, rounding off the game to an almost perfection. What was particularly great about Quake was that its maps were built round up for a multiplayer game and so made the ultimate deathmatch arenas. Also the game was designed to be completely open to the game modders and so allowing a dizzying array of mods being released, turning the game Quake into a jet shooter, even a rally game. My own personal favourite mod was Quake Borg, where the players that were killed in the deathmatch turned into additional Borgs, all wanting to assimilate you. Eventually there would be so many Borgs that the host PC running the game would simply crash by not being able to cope. 3D Realms would continue with its own niche of comedy shooters with Redneck Rampage and Shadow Warrior game. in 1997. Oh, He's offered both the humour of Duke with the great gameplay, but sadly it was overlooked by gamers who'd already fallen in love with the great games. One game released by 3D Realms was co-done by Monolith Games, who are best known today for their fear games. They released a game called Blood, and this took Duke Nukem Engine, but had you play a zombie warrior risen from the grave to fight his way back to the Dark God. The game's gore and horror setting combined with the humour, was a great fun alternative and it was an enjoyable variant to the other first person shooters out there. Ravensoft would release Hexen 2 in August of 1997, taking the Quake engine and modifying it to offer gamers more swords and sorcery for fantasy action. Also in October 1997, LucasArts would return with Jedi Knight Dark Forces 2, this time allowing you to continue the story of Kyle in full 3D and giving the gamers finally the ability to wield a lightsaber in the game. Finally, at the end of 1997, id Software would release Quake 2, a brilliant shooter adding much more to the single player experience, which had been a complaint aimed at the original Quake game. But it would be the following year that Jazz Jackrabbit developer Epic Games would come out from nowhere with their own 3D game engine, and a game which was called Unreal. This was a real hardware strainer for the time, 
and was one of the first games to really push mass upgrades of PC gamers' machines. But for those who did, it was well worth it, with an amazingly gorgeous 3D gaming experience, much prettier and engaging single-player story, looking so much better than the Quake 2 engine. For the game, the developer Epic Games enlisted the talents of James Smoltz, who had set up a company called Digital Extremes in 1993, which is perhaps better known today as the company who did the Bioshock games. Interestingly, it's Epic Games who have been a real success story of all these PC developers, with the Unreal Engine subsequent variants that they've produced still being used in most games today such as Mass Effect 2, Batman Arkham Asylum, Borderlands, all using the Unreal Game Engine. And of course, Epic Games themselves are still going strong, namely with their own Gear of War games that still push 3D gaming ever forward. Wow, that was quite an episode, wasn't it? But I think it was important to cover so much to make the full story arc of PC gaming through the 90s make sense. Anyway, look out for my next episode where we go back to the early 90s and the gaming world's first foray into the world of CDs. So until next time, see you later.